Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to the AI for Good Global Summit, all year, always online. My name is Ksenia von Den from the ITU, the International Telecommunication Union, and I have the privilege of introducing today's webinar. The ITU is the United Nations Specialized Agency for Information and Communication Technologies, and we are also the organizer of the AI for Good Global Summit, alongside XPRIZE Foundation and in partnership with 36 UN sister agencies, ACM and Cochrane Windwest Switzerland. The goal of the summit is to identify practical applications of AI to advance the sustainable development goals and scale those solutions for global impact. Like the most of the world, the AI for Good Summit has gone digital with a weekly programming allowing us to reach even more people across the globe. Today's webinar can be considered as part three of the Global Dialogue on Esports, organized in partnership with the Global Esports Federation, who recently joined us as an ITU member. And before I introduce today's moderator, let me go through quickly some housekeeping rules. So your mic has been disabled. If you wish to ask a question, please use the Q&A function. The moderator will select and read out the questions to the panelists. And we are particularly counting on your participation to create a very interactive discussion. And speaking about interactive, I have a challenge for you. So can you please let us know where you are calling from, which country or which city? And you can use the chat function to communicate. Uh, let me do it first. So I'm calling from Geneva and I will write it down in the chat. Please make sure that you are sending your message to all participants, attendees and panelists. So we have people calling from Argentina, Singapore, US, Lisbon, Uganda, China, Geneva, Netherlands, California, Florida, fantastic, Costa Rica. Welcome everyone. And now it's time to introduce our moderator who is no stranger to the world of gaming, esports, and technology, and she is one of the presenters of a very popular TV show, BBC Click. Her name is LJ Rich. LJ, welcome. Hi there. Thank you so much. And thank you, Ksenia, and thank you to the ITU, and welcome everybody to our third global session on esports. This is the rather giant topic of esports, technology, uh, communities, and hope, and it's going to be a good one. My name is LJ Rich, and I'm a TV presenter and music artist. I'll be your moderator for the next hour, and it's part of the AI for Good Global Summit, which is, as Ksenia said, virtual this year for obvious reasons. As with the other panels, you can chat, interact, and ask questions. We love receiving your questions, so please don't be shy. Come and ask. And thank you so much for choosing to spend the next 60 minutes with us. We do hope it's going to be worth your while. So it's time to say hello to our panel. In yesterday's rehearsal, they were already coming up with some intriguing ideas. So let's welcome them, let's welcome them all as they turn on their cameras. You already have their impressive credentials on the ITU website. Here they are. We have Anne Kelly Aikman from the Global Esports Federation. Miguel Gill, founder of the United States Esports Association. Sean Ming, co-founder of Ignites. William Louis Marie, CEO of World Squash Federation. And Inuilo Bonilla Barroso from Global Innovation Center powered by Microsoft. So thank you all for joining us. And whilst you're finishing sorting out your video and audio, I'll let you know what's in store. Today's panel will be split into three sections. What are the surprising new conversations about esports? Where can we create positive opportunities using esports and technology? And how hybrid can we go mixing esports and traditional sports and finding sustainable, meaningful ways to make the world better, not just esports, but beyond? So let's start off with our first segment on unconventional conversations, things you won't necessarily expect to be talking about. And that's what we're here for. And of course, none of this would be possible without that most fundamental of things, an internet connection, a device to connect to the web and a way to charge that device. As a world, we know that we don't have equal access to the internet or even electricity in some cases. So Ming, I know you've recently spent time in clinics at a refugee camp in Greece. Some patients were hard to contact because of technology, right? Absolutely. Um, we had, I'll, I'll give an example here. We had a patient who walked into our clinic um, having arrived the day before. And unfortunately this patient when on, on this patient's arrival, did not know where to go, did not know 
um, was speaking a different language, did not um, know where to go for food, did not know where to sleep, where to find shelter, but thankfully managed to find our clinic and had an injury that was so severe that they needed to come in every day to be looked at and for the wounds to be cleaned and dressed. Unfortunately, uh, for this patient, they did not have a watch, they did not have a mobile phone, and they did not have any friends around them with these devices as well. So it made it incredibly challenging to make sure that we were able to see the patient every day. We wanted to reduce the time that this patient would wait in the queue and in the hot sun. It was really hot at that time, and it was only going to get hotter. Mm -hmm. And as well, how, how could we, as advocates of this patient, guarantee that uh, we could reach out to them when we were finally able to organize transportation for them to a hospital or transportation for them to, um, to Athens, for example, where they could get further treatment. So in a location like this with more than 15,000 people in the camp and spilling out of the camp, how could we find this one person? So even if we know where they were sleeping at night, or at least the general area where they would sleep at night, they might be queuing for food, they might be queuing for paperwork, they might be queuing for the toilet, they might be queuing for any facility. And actually queuing, waiting and queuing is a huge part of the life of a, of a refugee in, in, these, uh, in this particular camp. Um, they wait for hours for food and water. And, and if they were to come in to see us to have their blood sugar tested or to have their blood pressure checked in order to help manage a chronic disease, for example, if they have come in fasting so that we can do their blood sugar um, and get some accurate data on that, um, depending on how long they have waited to see a doctor or, or to have all these, uh, these statistics checked, they might not actually be able to join the queue for their next meal. So on the point of technology, actually, we do know that doctors already around the world are practicing remote medicine um, using their computers, doing remote consultations. And of course, this does not cover all of the needs. Uh, we know that medicine happens at skin level. We do need to, not only to see a patient, but sometimes to palpate an injury, for example. So yes, technology does not meet all the needs, but it can be a tool used to support uh, patients uh, who are not able to come in. Then of course, it depends on the technology, first of all, being available for these patients. And again, there was another refugee camp, in fact, that I could, that I can speak of where it takes hours for a patient to walk from one sector of the refugee camp to another sector of the refugee camp where there's a clinic. Not all sectors have a clinic in it. And in fact, to get to the hospital outside, hours is really not an exaggeration um, to be mm -hmm. walking. So, and of course, then the assumption is, first of all, the patient can walk. And we know that not all patients can walk. Mm -hmm. so, yes. Indeed. And I think that um, this is a, a really interesting, um, what's the word I'm trying to look it's, it's very interesting to be talking about this situation in a webinar all about esports, but actually there are so many ways that we can be connected with technology and how valuable the, the role is of technology in, in all of our lives. And hopefully we'll be able to extend our knowledge of technology and connection, how that works out towards places which are um, you know, which have very, very uh, tangible real world problems. And uh, Ming um, is going to be talking to us later about uh, some of the esports uh, psychology, which I'm looking forward to. So we're going to come back to you later on. Um, so another goal today is talking about conversations we won't normally have and we don't have the answers yet but we do have the power to open a dialogue which is why we're encouraging questions in the chat as well so um uh, ming was just uh, speaking there from norway and now we're going to go over to Anne, who i believe is in beijing we've got a truly international panel today and you were in hainan just last week attending tencent's fourth global esports conference can you talk to us about what's different compared to previous years Yes, hello everybody. I'm calling in absolutely participating from Beijing, China. Uh, it's quite late in the evening here, so I think we're also spanning uh, many different time zones around the world. But yes, absolutely. I had the privilege um, of having uh, been invited to the Tencent Global Esports Conference that took place in Boao in Hainan last week um, to represent the Global Esports Federation. So big privilege, obviously, as there's a lot of travel restrictions right now around the world. Um, 
but was one of the only international attendees there. Um, and as you said, LJ, this was their fourth uh, global summit. Um, and some of the features this year, and I, I should probably summarize, there were about 1,200 participants um, at the forum. And really the purpose of the forum is, or the conference is to, um, to bring together all different um, members of the esports ecosystem, whether you're an event management company, a team, uh, a city, um, a publisher. So very exciting to be part of a very young and dynamic um, environment there. Uh, but specifically this year, what was what was different is this is the first time that the commercial brands were present at this conference. So there was a large panel um, with several different brands being represented about why they were getting involved in esports and how the particular opportunities linking to sponsors around teams and events was quite powerful for brands and providing them some different and unusual um, content. Um, equally, there was a large representation from cities across China um, who are obviously very keen to begin to understand esports, the events and what that represents and also the business opportunity of, of the different companies within the esports ecosystem potentially setting up um, in their respective um, cities around China. So we're talking really about fostering communities and it actually sounds like a great place for you in, in Rigo to um, tell us about some of the challenges you're currently facing and, uh, and what you'd need to solve them because you're working with big players and startups alike. And whilst I'm talking, I should mention Chris Chan, who's online from Singapore, the president of uh, the Global Esports Foundation. Hello to you. Thanks for joining us. So uh, that's given you a little bit more time to think up your answer in Ego. What do you think are the, the sort of big problems that you would like to solve working with big players and startups to foster communities. Um, I think at this, I think um, at this juncture, one of the main um, kind of missions of the Global Esports Federation is to really be at the service of the industry right now. And obviously it's, it's a very sort of um, new ecosystem coming together with players, as you say, in all different shapes and sizes and people trying to find out what's their role. Um, people like myself coming from traditional sports, um, how do we use our knowledge from traditional sports to try and begin to, um, to elevate um, uh, and, and elevate the credibility of, of esports and give it that that robust uh, infrastructure in order for esports to develop everything from how is the sport organized on a national level? How does the sport get funding? How does it rec get recognition for the players? Uh, making sure that they can travel internationally, making sure that when we have international competitions, we have the best players. And these are all things I think in traditional sports that we, we automatically assume are easy and they will happen naturally. Um, but as we're discovering in esports, um, as it's quite a new phenomena and a new, um, area of activity, a lot of those things um, are not there and we need to help to develop that to make sure we can elevate um, esports to the level um, that it needs to be. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Miguel, can I bring you in here, please? Because uh, as an AI for Good Summit, should we talk a little about how AI could make esports and traditional sports closer together? For example, what can the USEA and World Squash Federation learn from each other? Absolutely, and good afternoon from Valencia, Spain, uh, to everyone joining the the, the webinar today. Um, yeah, so so I think there's there's quite a lot of learnings that we can take from each other, and and as we were chatting yesterday in our rehearsal, it's all about exchange of value. So um, even though there's that message that esports is a newer uh, into, you know, it's a newer industry versus traditional sports, that's true. However, at the same time, um, the people involved in esports have been at it for a long time and are experts in that area, same as on traditional sports. So what it happens to be right now is that we can all learn from each other. And I used the example yesterday about um, what could potentially William's organization and our organization learn from each other. So in, in, in a, a very quick example is how do we exchange values? So, so one offering is to say, look, um, the World Squash Federation is not in the court to be an expert on, on gaming and the virtual world, but that's exactly the expertise that our organization has. So how can we be of best of use for someone like a World Squash Federation to give them uh, education to give them learning, to give them insight on what are the possibilities, how to do things better, how to actually engage that core demographic that is not 
um, that is not active today playing squash, but they still could do activities that are related with gaming. And at the same time, a young organization, a nonprofit, and up and coming like the USCA can learn a lot from an established organization like the World Squash Federation in terms of how to fundraise, how to actually set up, how to run an organization to actually really work on behalf of the mission, in this case of the USCA, which our mission is simply foster the growth of recreational esports in the US. So that's, um, that's essentially kind of like how we see this plan. And if I may, uh, LJ, I wanted to kind of like share a personal story um, that is connected to the first subject that we were talking about at the beginning, which is just um, unconventional conversations that, 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 that technology could drive. So at the same time that we're having yesterday our, um, our rehearsal for this webinar, actually members of my team were having a conversation with a wonderful nonprofit uh, called All Access Gaming, which one of the founders of the nonprofit actually has cerebral palsy. The reason why I bring this is because in, in the spirit of making inclusion a theme and being more inclusive, the ask from the founders of All Access, which are Brad and Daniel, shout out to both of them, was to hold the, the call in Zoom and not in Discord, which is the preferred method that we do it because it's the known tool or technology tool to have it. The main reason was because for them, especially for Brad, Zoom was more accessible than uh, Discord. So the, even a small thing like, it's, and I say small from the sense of because that tool really works and accommodates um, the needs of, of this individual, we have to make sure that we can actually, even the tools that we have in gaming, we have to make them more accessible. So that's a clear example of how we can actually bring this together from both sides of the world and how do we make it better for everybody. Yeah, that's awesome. I think accessibility is something that we could um, and have and will chat about quite a lot more if we can. And it's also a subject close to mine and, and many people's hearts. Thank you for that story. And uh, I think now is a good time to bring William in because, William, you come from traditional sports uh, and you decided to join esports to build bridges. And, and please tell us why you see this as a collaboration and not a war. Yeah, thank you. And thank you, Miguel, for giving me some tips for my next operational plan for the next two years. Uh, we're going to have a separate talk, but you no, know, I think it's, it's kind of, I look like the ambassador of the 20th century. When I look at the panelists, you know, coming from a traditional sport, we've been playing squash for more than 150 years. So how can we build bridges and ensure that we're going to keep growing our sport, you know, squash, as we move to the 21st century? You know, for I think, and Anne touched on a couple of key points. You know, as an international federation, we know how to operate. We've been organizing world championships. We're part of the multi sports game forever. And for the last 10 to 20 years, we've seen a side of us, a huge development, a great momentum from esports without knowing what's going on. We just see the momentum. And all of a sudden, we say, well, maybe we should have a look at them and start to open discussions. The, the issue is about opening a dialogue within our two communities. Traditional sport, we go out, we practice, we buy a racket, a ball, we get 150 affiliated members. And all of a sudden, we see kids playing esports within great arena, receiving prize money with great sponsors, but we don't know each other very well. So as a traditional federation, I think my best objective was to partner with Global Esports Federation to understand this community, to say what's going to be the impact of the esports development. And how can I, let's say, um, understand better this, this momentum and build on this momentum to also grow my market, grow, have better access to the traditional squash players. And I think this kind of panel and all the discussions we're going to have uh, in the coming months and years going to help us to say there is no traditional sport and e-sport. There is a common ground within all these activities and we need to build bridges and to work closely together. And I think Miguel made a point about values. We know the values of traditional sports, you know, with all the sports we love, we watch on TV, we practice. But what are the values of e-sports? And as soon as we understand each other better, we're going to be able to build a common future. And this is what it's all about. And I think Anne made the point uh, from Beijing. We, we need to build bridges. We are not on a separate roads. We are walking and looking in the same direction because we have 
we are, let's say, tackling the same issues and we are talking to the same communities. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I think the last part of our um, talk today, we're going to try and look at some hybrid solutions that are already there. And please, audience, keep your questions coming in. We will be very happy to put some of them to our panel. And I can see at least one that I'm going to be asking very soon. Um, Inigo, you've been very patient allowing us chat, uh, to chat away. So I'd like to bring you in. I know that you have a, an interest in AI, as do all of us. Can you just tell us a little bit about how AI fits machine learning into esports? Well, uh, first of all, good afternoon, everyone from Spain, from Madrid. Uh, thanks, LJ, for, for giving me the floor. In this sense, uh, well, um, I think uh, technology and, and innovation is fully linked with, uh, with the esports industry, okay? And the artificial intelligence is playing a key role, okay? First of all, we, we should apply for the esport industry some technologies that, are, uh, that have been developed for the traditional sports. So, for example, AI is one of them. In order to measure the performance about uh, for the for the players in this sense, and also how we can uh, with uh, AI technologies uh, measure this performance and have a market value for the different players, because with this uh, kind of technologies, then the, the the teams could have a clear perspective about the impact that the players could could generate in in the market. So it's uh, it's really important, and also apart from that, uh, I think uh, innovation and technology is going to be very um, important for the industry in terms of um, monetizing the content, okay? Because uh, we, we should target the communication that we are sending to, to the fans. And it's also really important in terms of play, team and player performance, okay? To centralize all the information about the, the player's performance in training sessions and, and also in the competition. So many thanks. Uh, let's continue. Well, um, let's move on to section two now, which is how we can use sport and technology to create some constructive change. Before we do that, I'm just going to um, give you all the question that we've received from Tony Kalu or Carlu. Um, the question is, what's the best way to go about setting up an e-sports competition regionally? Now, this question is from the UK, but I guess this would be a, a nice question for uh, anywhere in the world. Is, is it different? How would you go about setting up an e-sports competition? I, I can I can jump in. <laughs> yeah, so I, I you know it's uh, obviously it, there's there's uh, there's geographical uh, limitations to this and, and usually but usually um, you know there are companies that are specializing on this and, and it depends on which level and which scale you want to do it. You can do it all at the, at the biggest level at the professional level all the way down to a community level. Uh, tournament. So in the UK, for example, um, there's a company called Gfinity and, and Gfinity is one of the companies that are they're known for, for doing um, a lot of esports competitions. So that could be an example of, of a grand scale um, a kind of um, um, a production. But then you can go to local level and you can do uh, an event in your local town, whether you're in Manchester or whether you are in, in, in London itself, in one of the areas of London. And, and I think a good idea for that in a good sense is for, um, I didn't get the name of the person, I'm sorry, but to actually check out the British Esports Association. The British Esports Association, they have what, it's a wonderful resource uh, to start understanding how it's done. And, 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 and yes, they, they, can, they can give you at least uh, an understanding of, of things to consider, and then you can keep going from there. So it depends on the scale, but usually um, starting with a resource like the British Esports Association could give you a lot of uh, insight on how to, how to do that. Oh, thank you, Miguel. And thanks, Tony, for your question. It's much appreciated. So section two, as promised, um, how can we use sport to create positive, constructive change? And um, Anne, I'd like to bring you back in here. Um, can you tell us a bit more about the cities in China experimenting with supporting specific teams or particular esports games? It sounds a bit to me like, um, you know, the NFL or Premier League football. It, it sounds like a slightly different model to single players sort of playing um, remotely. Sure. I mean, I think right now where, where the development of the different teams are, uh, Shanghai in China is where a lot of the esports is being developed and a lot of the training centers seem to have gravitated to the southern part of China. Um, but as it's growing, cities are seeing the opportunity to to be bringing, as I said earlier, bringing some of that talent and bringing some of that business to other parts of uh, of China. So that's something that's that's developing um, 
quite rapidly here. And also I should say, you know, the use of traditional stadiums. And I think, you know, the development of esports here in China really exploded in 2017 with the League of Legends World Championships that took place in the Bird's Nest, which as you all recall, the Bird's Nest was built for the 2008 Olympic Games here, which was the opening and closing ceremony stadium as well as the track and field stadium. And it was really utilizing a traditional sports venue and converting it into an esports arena, which was which was absolutely phenomenal. Um, the stadium was packed with, with tens of thousands of, uh, of fans uh, and spectators. It was viewed by about 60 million uh, people around the world. So it was an absolutely phenomenal event, you know, using a traditional facility uh, for esports. And that's really what, what, um, what, what, ex- you know, what led to the explosion of esports and, and the number of fans it attracted, not only in the stadium, but outside the stadium and that whole kind of experiential part of, of attending a sporting, a, an esports competition. Yeah. Um, and in fact, I think now to bring in Ming back about this, this aspect of esports. And for those of you who are uh, asking on the chat, what is an esport? I guess the best way to describe it is you're playing competitively. You just happen to be using something electronic. It's, it is just as physical in some cases. I think the demands on the body is just as much as any elite athlete. And we're, we're going to hear a little bit more about this because as us, we are non esports athletes. What can we learn from the, the people at the top of their game, quite literally? in esports case. What do you think, Ming? Well, actually, I would be curious to hear from Miguel about this because uh-huh. we we know that esport, at least the stereotype around esport, is that it is a typically representative of a, of a very reclusive and very unhealthy aspect of society and a very unhealthy way of living. But we know that top esports athletes are in fact incredibly concerned with maintaining good health so that they have optimal performance as athletes, in fact. And I think Miguel probably could touch on that. Um, I, would, I would be really interested to hear what Miguel has to say about this because of I think you have bigger insights into the world of the athletes and their teams and their supports and the doctors and psychologists that come in. Yeah, thank you. And, and get ready because I could be here for six hours. So um, I don't know if everything. <laughs> no, but, but you know, it's a very complex subject. Um, and 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 it's uh, very wide, um, and it's a lot of things to tackle. But I did. I, I'll, I'll try to answer in a couple of different ways, and, and and keep keep it short because we are short on time. But at the end of the day, if you want to be a high performance individual, no matter for what, whether it's sports, whether it's esports, whether it's you know whether it's being a writer or a, or a musical artist, artist like LJ, it's all about balance. We all need balance in our lives and we have to eat well, we have to sleep well, we have to have physical activity, um, we have to have our mental fitness as well. Um, so all of it is not a secret. And if we wanna be a high performance individual, we have to keep all of these uh, and making these checks and balances. For esports, it's nothing differently. It's the same thing. Now, yes, there's there's, because esports is new, because it's gaming, and because gaming is a bigger gaming is the bigger industry, and esports is part of it. There's a lot of still of stigma that is out there. But if there's something that we can do from our perspective, from a technology perspective, is how do we accelerate actually the knowledge sharing? How do we elevate and really share what it takes to be a competitive player? How do we use technology, like Inigo was saying, to actually? Um, expose people to the actual physical metrics. It's well known that the eye-hand coordination of an extreme uh, accurate esports athlete, it's, it's the best in the world, the reaction time, the precision that they have with millimeters and milliseconds of reaction. So these are the things that we need to also leverage and use. So bringing it back to the, to the question is, it's no different. You have to have all of the different ways of preparation than any traditional sports athlete has been. So yes, it is true that today at the highest level of the professional level of the professional esports team, they're starting to adapt that. But in reality, if we want to grow this industry and if we want to start developing the best pipeline for the next generation, So today we actually have to bring all of that knowledge that we have from a player development perspective in the traditional sports and bring it down to the local level, right? 
bring it down to the to the gaming arena that goes into my my community and how do we start bringing these player development programs that we have very well defined in organizations in traditional sports i use tennis as an example uh, the 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 spanish federation of tennis has a player development program that goes from kids being five year old all the way to the professional and the specifically in each age group they tackle different things where at the beginning you start being more recreational and at the end you can become more professional. So we have to establish that also for esports and actually not only um, establish it, but actually share it and actually uh, have it available for all of these organizations worldwide that we're trying to do. So that is from that perspective. Um, and I'll keep, I'll cut it short because I know I wanted to say more and I forgot. So <laughs> I'll leave it like that. Uh, just if I, if I may, uh, to jump on what Miguel said, I think this is where traditional federation can bring their expertise because we know how to manage and operate you know, an athlete from a younger age to a professional level and after his ret retirement of the court. We know that because this is what we've been doing for a century. And this is the expertise we can bring to the eSport federation, to the eSport world because we know how to act. We know what kind of uh, hurdles we need to address, what kind of issues we need to tackle. And this is one of the bridges we can build on with the esports understanding. I have one question anyway, when you mentioned AJ that esport is commonly an activity with an electronic device. Is that correct? Um, I'm not sure what the formal definition is. I'm sure the Global Esports Federation has, uh, has something somewhere. But I would imagine if you're going to contrast it between, I don't know, a, a tennis player, then uh, there's, there's still physical stuff. But the, well, hang on, because thinking about it, you can get rackets, which yeah. tennis players use, which can analyze how a person is well, using the gun, rackets. And, uh, yeah. So, yes, it's, it's very much we're blurring the lines. And I think we can probably talk about this later in, in a, a further section. And I'm, I'm trying my best to sort of steer us gently in through our subjects. And I, I think the danger is, is that all of us are fascinated by a wide area <laughs> where I'm trying to sort of focus us all in. I, I do know, though, when we're talking about sports, it's, it's a whole person thing, isn't it? We've, we've got the physical aspect of playing, but we've also got the psychological aspect. And I feel like there is um, even more psychological psychological aspects when you are sort of focusing so much mentally as well as physically when you're when you're doing sort of preparations for esports and then afterwards I'm I'm pretty certain there's quite a lot of concentration going on when you watch people on the stages. LJ if I may jump in yeah. a little on the point on, on psychology um, there's something very fascinating I think it's a unique quality of gaming if you went to a movie, for example, and you watched the protagonist of this movie making the summit of Denali, after coming home, you wouldn't turn to your friend and say, well, that was amazing. When I summited the Denali, I, I experienced a lightning storm. Whereas in a game, when playing a game, you would then recount your experience to a friend and tell them that today in this particular world, in this, in this gaming world, I fished for, I don't know, the legendary polka dotted lobster and climbed to the peak of this high mountain, which is next to very high mountain and watched the rays of the setting sun illuminate the ancient structures that reveal the relic that would then activate the et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So in the case of a game, I would have taken action, whoever the I is, I would have made the decisions, I was enabled. And it's an incredible power of gaming where you are given a sort of efficacy through, through the action of gaming. You are taking action, you are making decisions rather than sort of the more um, distant experience of art and distant experience of, because I consider the creation of games art and games are a form of art and absolute beauty in their own way. Um, so rather than say, for example, going to a concert where you experience it, but you are not the actor in that case. So I think that's something absolutely fascinating about gaming and efficacy, by the way, uh, because this is a point of passion for me, efficacy is um, key to our resilience. And it's, it's one of the points of psychological first aid that we utilize um, or that we work towards in applying, um, especially in times of great stress and, and um, unexpected events, for example. So it's one mm -hmm. of the principles. 
I'd like to just steer everybody back to AI because we are doing AI for good. And I would like to talk a bit more about the role of AI and machine learning in, in things more than just sort of, I guess, more than just analytics of, of, of player stats and things. Where, where do you think it can also help? Would AI play a role in, um, in compression or in uh, stopping bottlenecks or in helping players compete more competitively? And I've just, who would like to talk a little bit about AI's increasing role? Uh, I, can, I can volunteer some thoughts. I don't know how smart they're gonna sound, but um, I, think, I think this is where, I think my comment is gonna go from where actually the video game in esports industry can add value to the traditional sports industry. Um, it's a very well known that AI, it's a, it, it's a lot of the video games are uh, built on AI intelligence as well, because you're playing as one character and then you have AI controlling the rest of the action, what's going on. But I think that knowledge base from a, from a technology perspective could be applicable big time. And maybe Inigo can, can jump in on this one after, after I make the point to say, look, there is a lot of um, actually, in a way, training tools or uh, even performance tools that you can take from a, from a principles of gaming, utilizing the AI principles to actually help train traditional sports players and actually show them different scenarios or based on different techniques and actually kind of like showing the progression of how could it look like just by simply applying this, this principle. So I think in my mind, um, that's a scenario where, where by having that interaction between the traditional sport entity and someone with a gaming background, you can actually start also um, pushing from one side to the other a lot of these learnings and actually try to help both sides. And, and especially in this case of traditional sports is how to use these techniques. And I think this comment brings more relevance in the current environment that we're right now, where you have a lot of traditional sports athletes that couldn't go out and do the actual training that they wanted to do, but they could have been actually training other facets in more on the psychological side or understanding strategy by leveraging some sort of kind of product like this, if they had it available. I'm pretty sure there are some of those and Maybe Inigo can come here and say there's 25 and list them all, which I'm pretty mm -hmm. sure there exists. But the point I say, I think there's there's a lot to be done there in that area. Actually, I have one question for you, uh, Miguel, is uh, because traditional sports we know that the, um, the the physical preparation for the for the athletes is very important. Okay, and here we are talking a lot a lot about uh, the importance of the psych the psychological. Um, preparation for the for the esports players. What about the the physical uh, preparation for the for the esports players? What do you think about it? A hundred percent. It's still it's still a variable, right? And it's as important as the psychological part of it. Um, and and I, I'm not I'm not trained on one side or the other. But at the end of the day, what I know based on every piece of content that I've least I like consume in herd experts like me is that you actually need both. You have to be an actually uh, active individual in top f physical shape and also in top mental shape to actually be a high performing athlete. So athlete defined loosely, whether it's for sports, whether it's for um, esports, or whether it's for working at home, you have to actually have both. So um, Inigo, the question of, do you have to be f f physically fit? Yes. Do you have to mentally fit? Yes. Now the question is, how do we actually bring those programs, not only at the professional level, but actually down? How do we create a same infrastructure of academies that you have or to use football as an example from the professional level to the six-year-olds? How do we mimic something like that that encompasses the values and principles that we need? Uh, and that's what William was touching on earlier in the conversation, that there's a lot of experience that we can all mix, but actually, what we need to accelerate is to make it available. We actually have to have that, what we think is the minimum and actually put it and make it available to all the organizations and then actually start building those programs up. Because right now, esports has been a lot top down. We need to start building the bottoms up. And it's a great just, time to, oh, sorry, go on, William. Seconds, uh, just, I think now it's not even a question, it's how you do you manage it? You know, I think every athlete, every, uh, Professional teams right now, they have a lot of 
a team working on you know being able to analyze all the data available you know for a century you were relying on the eyes of your coach to help you to improve you know your 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 skills your expertise and to progress right now you need to go to a computer or to your app you know about two thirds of the runners they join on an application where we can share their data, their improvements. So now it's not a question about if, it's how you do it. And this is where we need some kind of to, to, uh, to liaise with the right companies and external sources, because we need to have this, ex this expertise that we don't know internally. But right now as an athlete or a professional team or an international federation, the question is how you're gonna manage all the data available to ensure that you're gonna bring that to your sport and your sport is going to be more relevant to your, to your different audiences, including your fans. When you see a, a squash rally, you want to know how many shots were made, how many kilometers or miles he ran for, for 30 minutes. And it's, it creates a new kind of consuming sport. And that's the way it is now. It's not a question of how or when. You have to do it immediately. I think uh, MIT did a thing a few years ago where they took the game of chess and to try to make it more palatable to a wider audience, they, they styled it to look like a football match where they had stats and they had sort of form and they kind of had a commentary and they were using sort of AI to analyze what the most likely next moves were and things like that. So um, I can certainly see some ways that we can merge sort of traditional and esports. And it's a great time, I think, to go into segment three where we are trying to expand our thoughts beyond the esport bubble. How do we add meaning and, and what are big companies doing to prepare for the future that they know is coming? Again, this is an open question please feel free to answer. Well, I think right now there are a lot of, I mean, from, from, from my experience in, in working with the GEF over the course of the last eight months, I think that's a really good question, LJ. I think right now, a lot of companies, I mean, there's certainly a number of endemic companies who have been supporting esports for, for decades now um, and have an inherent um, relevancy, um, you know, whether it's a computer or some of the peripherals or whatever, but some of the other brands out there um, are actually struggling and trying to understand how can they, how can they get involved? What's the best way for them to support in a very authentic way? Because I think if there's one thing we know about esports is, is that the fans and the players are quite discerning about who, who gets Gets involved and why they're getting involved in supporting their their particular their particular game. So I think that's that's a good question. I think you know at the GEF we we talk to a lot of brands and and depending on those who've gotten involved, they more or less know what they're you know what they're trying to get out of it if they're sponsoring a specific game. But many brands out there right now are bombarded by so many different opportunities and from so many different angles um, that they're really trying to. To, to untangle the web, how does it all fit together? And that's part of the role of the GEF. We talk to a lot of people, we talk to a lot of organizations um, and particularly the commercial brands is, is taking them through what is the landscape of esports and what are the different opportunities that they have to get involved at the different levels, whether it's sponsoring a player, a team, a women's team, what's the angle of, of, of association for them? Uh, I'd like to add something, sorry, in you go. Um, no, 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 do you wanna go? Okay, I just wanted to add something which is a little bit, maybe a little bit different, but there, there's definitely an element for gaming and esports, which is engagement. And we know that engages very well, especially for the younger generation. So if there is something that we can also actually help also is there is um, education. So education and, and, and the traditional education system, um, how can it, use and leverage um, gaming and esports to actually continue with that engagement factors of their students. And then we need to facilitate that. We need to actually come up and, and again, comes down to facilitating and making the information available. We need to actually help how to bring to traditional education all the aspects that it can be done and can be learned and can be used. Uh, in a gaming and traditional esports fashion. So there's still a lot of gaps of understanding what the, the, the good areas and the pros and how can gaming and esports can be leveraged. And I look at us as members of the GEF, but also as us as other organizations like the one, the one that, I, that I happen to be a member of, um, that that is really, if there is any help that we can get from companies or from either from IT, to you and other ones is how do we accelerate that knowledge transfer 
How do we actually help organizations get that knowledge there and then share it around? Because the more that we do that, then the, the acceleration of acceptance and the acceleration of even increasing the businesses and all the future that is coming. Because the, there's no question that our post-COVID future is a hybrid. Nobody knows in which mix, but it's, it's, it's not a question anymore. So how do we keep pushing that forward? That's, that's the, something that we, we really need to think of and, and go after. I totally, I totally agree with uh, Miguel and Anne. And on top of that, I think one of the the key decision makers, okay, for for a for a sponsor to to sponsor an e-sport competition or a or a club, is that uh, they want to reach out uh, new, new audiences, okay. So uh, they want to engage uh, with younger audiences, and that's the reason why they they are starting promoting or sponsoring these kind of uh, competitions. And the the main challenge that they are facing. Uh, at least in in Europe or or Spain, is the the return of investment uh, of investment, okay? Because they are investing a lot of money sponsoring these uh, clubs or these competitions, but they are constantly thinking about the return of investment, because because at uh, the first years it's very difficult to measure the impact that you are generating with these sponsorships. Mm-hmm. It doesn't sound unlike a startup by the sounds of things. Um, I'm, I'm aware of the time, so I'm just going to ask you uh, one more sort of giant question to everybody before I start um, trying to deliver as many of these questions to you as possible that we've got from our fantastic audience. Um, so look, the role of AI and telecommunications becomes ever more important here. So the question is for all of our panelists, which Miguel, you very briefly touched on, if you could have anything magically done to help what would be the thing you'd like solved right now? Would it be access to processing power? What barriers would you like removed? Is there research you'd like completed? You know, our audience is made up of some amazing influential people who, who might be able to help. And uh, so, so now's your chance. What do you think you'd like to be solved right now? I'll, I'll jump at it because I, my list is huge. Um, <laughs> But but Need no, some this... room for everyone else, though. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, joking aside, and 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 I mean, I mean, this goes and this goes back to the previous comment where we're talking about what technology comment uh, technology companies are are doing. And y- you know, I spent 13 years working at Microsoft and and the and Xbox team, and I've seen how complex and how everything is is managed at that level. But if there's one thing that we need to to, if I would ask help of people, would be um, you know, especially organizations like the ITU and organizations um, like, like the other uh, bigger federations is come and help us on the esports side. There's a wonderful array of organizations trying to do the right thing on behalf of growing uh, the next generation of esports athletes. Um, come and help us, whether it's volunteering, whether it's making donations or whether it's sharing knowledge and teaching us how to do things there is no reason why we shouldn't be able to do these things. So I think there's a lot of resources that are here. Even I've seen a lot of questions in this panel. There's a lot of people that don't understand what esports are. Come and talk to us. Come and engage to the Global Esports Federation. Come and engage with us at the USCA. We're more than happy to give you uh, as much information as we can because it's a very complex industry. So the one thing that we all need to do for each other is, is share knowledge right now. It's the most important thing that we can do in my personal opinion. Okay, fantastic. If I may, if I may add, you know, I think coming from traditional sports, I think if we want to engage, and this is why I've decided and the World Squad Federation has decided to partner with the Global Esports Federation is the market looks very fragmented. And if we want to engage into this kind of e-sport revolution and bring e-sport values and, and, and understanding within traditional sports, sometimes because of the fragmentation of the market, it looks very difficult for us to find the right uh, support or the right expert. You know, traditional sport, if you want to uh, play squash, you go to your national federation and there is an international federation. Because of the fragmentation of e-sport market, it's very difficult sometimes to, to really address the key issues and speak to the right person that's gonna give us the right answer. And this is what we need to also to address globally because we are well organized, but we have 100 years of history and esports has to understand how we are organized and how there should be a structure in the future. And I think uh, Global Esports Federation is doing the right, taking the right route to help us traditional sports to engage into this conversation and dialogue with the esports community. Okay, and if so I could, got a pl- sorry, go if on. I could jump in, 
uh, what you said, and that's exactly right. Uh, that's exactly right, William. That the, the purpose of why you know the, the GEF was set up as a value-based organization is exactly that is is to really create um, a federation that brings everybody in the ecosystem um, together. And as a value-based organization, you know, it's all about inclusivity um, and and really promoting. The, the, the values of sport, you know, of equity, fair play, diversity, and inclusion and innovation as well. I mean, that's, that's what we at the GEF are trying to, trying to bring that ecosystem together with our hashtag, you know, hashtag world connected is trying to connect all these bodies, which uh, as you can appreciate is, is, is very difficult um, be, because of the way that the industry has grown, the way we've had traditional sports sport evolved through the national federations, the international federations, but that's very much the purpose of the GEF and what we're, what we're, what we're trying to accomplish. Okay, thank you. I think we can certainly see that networking is uh, probably a very powerful thing that we can at least try to address. Um, I'm aware now that it's, goodness, we've only got nine minutes left, so I'm gonna try and get some of these questions in as well. We've got one from Dan Zhang saying, is it possible for AI to be a referee in an e-sport game or even a traditional sport game? Um, I'm presuming AI, we're gonna say that's further than just deciding whether something is in or out. Does anyone have thoughts on that? I, I, I'm not going to venture to say anything on that one. That's too hard to know. It depends on what it is. I, I, yeah. I was just thinking, I think I was just thinking the same example you were thinking LJ with the in and out, which, which is in tennis. And that's, that's just a fraction of deciding whether the technology is saying if it's in or out. But um, I, that, that's something that I cannot have an opinion really. I mean, I've got a limited knowledge of AI and I, I do train AIs for music purposes. And I would probably like to hazard a guess along, along the lines of if you've got a good enough data set of referees making a call one way or another, and you can feed that as cleaned data into a machine learning program, then there is a possibility that what comes out may approximate what a human would do. But I would also add that humans tend to disagree <laughs> quite a lot is certainly in sort of artistic areas such as sport there's always room for uh, what's the word margins of error and I guess that's also what makes sport so watchable in in some aspects so uh, I guess that question is sort of answered and not at the same time I think if I may I think AI is going to bring a lot of support to any kind of referee in any sport but the final decision has to remain in the hands of a referee period and uh, my magic uh, person on the end of a chat group here, the, the back channel has just said that in baseball, they're currently trying computer umpires, but I'm not entirely sure which, um, which part of the world that's in. I'm guessing it may well be the States, but I would imagine in, in terms of if it's, if it's a, a very digital type decision, then it would be probably reasonably easy for an AI to do that, especially if computer vision is involved. Um, okay, we've got another question here. Um, working with the stigma and impact around violent aspects of some esports games that aren't as strongly present in traditional sport? That's a really interesting question. Who'd like to take that? Hmm. Can, can you just repeat it just to make sure that, that we're gonna address the right thing? Yes, I think um, this is from Megumi Oyama who says, how do you work with the stigma and impact around violent aspects of some esports games? that are not strongly present in traditional sport. Um, I mean, I would imagine that there are some traditional sport that does have an aspect of, of violence in terms of, I don't know, boxing, that's hitting people, isn't it? Um, obviously, it's a completely different thing, or, or is it? Help me, to, someone, I don't a, understand. I think we have to make a difference between esports and gaming. This is true, we can find a lot of you know, gaming activities which, which are quite violent, if we can define but as far as this point is concerned i think we are we, we are trying to stay away from the violence that we can find in other esports or game act e-gaming activities if i'm correct i think that's a great philosophical question and again this is exactly the sort of place where we want to open dialogue about that i would say in any um in any society we do have you know an entire range of of activities and uh, i think that's probably true of esports as well it's like a, a mirror to society uh, people do what people do um, we have a couple of other questions with our last few minutes um, we've got one saying that for developing countries in asia and africa there's a rising digital divide across the globe 
um, the question is about whether it remains a challenge, but I'd like to add a little corollary to that. In the age of COVID-19, what do we think is happening here with um, developing countries and the digital divide? Do we, what can we do to help more people get access? I, if I, I, I like to um, add something to that to that question because I, I'm actually I'm originally from 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 uh, Latin America from Venezuela so obviously uh, Venezuela being part of the third world um, and I, I kind of understand this digital divide and it's true but at the same time um, there's something that is very common in some areas of the world where you know in a lot of areas of the world especially in the developing countries um, uh, the adoption in the the uh, evolution of the of the mobile platform. Um, it's, it's, it's more widespread than, than PC and web, right? So actually in the world of esports and competitive gaming, there's also professional games and professional esports being played on the mobile platform. So that's actually an avenue. There's countries like Brazil that one of the biggest uh, games that they play competitively as a country, it's also on the mobile uh, platform itself. So I think it depends on um, obviously um, that's no different than technology adoption and, and it's kind of like following the same trend, but also um, the fact that because you don't have access to a PC uh, doesn't mean that you can play video games competitively. Uh, that may or may not be true because actually there are competitive games or video games that are actually played on the mobile platform as well. Mm -hmm. Yes, brilliant. Thank you very much. And I think we are actually out of time now. So thank you so much, panelists, William, Miguel, Ming, Anne, and Inigo. Thank you also to the ITU and Global Esports. This does feel like just the beginning of a long and fruitful dialogue, and hopefully this will continue out into the ether and please feel free to contact each other afterwards. Uh, thank you all to the technical team. Thank you so much for your work. We appreciate it. And a final thank you to you, our audience, for your time, attention and generosity. Um, it's time for me now to hand back to Ksenia to wrap up this session and give us a taste of future events. Thank you. Thank you very much, LJ, for your excellent job moderating on all the great questions. And I would like to also thank all our panelists for your insights. And of course, the Global Esports Federation for helping us to put this together. As I said in the intro, this was part three of the Global Dialogue on Esports, and we are planning to organize part four on 17 November that will be focused on esports in the developing countries. And tomorrow, we invite you to join us for the AI for Good Innovation Factory live pitching session. And to register, please visit our website and my colleagues, they're also posting all the related information in the chat right now. And of course, we have a number of upcoming sessions. Um, we invite you to join us next week for the session in partnership with Botner Foundation um, on digital rights. And you can find all the information again right now in the chat or on our website. And the week after, we have a keynote session with uh, Lucas Hoppa, uh, Chief Environmental Officer from Microsoft. Um, to register, please visit our website and you can find all the information in the chat. We would like to also thank our partners, sponsors, and Switzerland, our co-convener for continuing support. So thank you everyone and hope to see you next week.